put that down. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a treat to be here with you this evening. Um, and uh, if you would turn off your cell phones or put them on stun or whatever, um, I would be forever grateful. Um, just so we can focus. Um, I'm a, another one of the legions of people who is here because Giddy asked me to be here. I'm not paid or anything. I volunteered because I think this is uh, such an important project. And I was actually taking a walk on the Tayelet this morning uh, before breakfast out here on the beach. And um, I was thinking, you know, Giddy, Theodore Herzl would be so, so proud uh, of, this, uh, of this session because um, it's a sign to me of Israel becoming normal. Uh, one of the challenges I always felt as a reporter here in Israel was to cover Israel as a country, not as a conflict. And when I can come to an event, be invited to an event in Tel Aviv where it, Israel is doing what Thailand is doing and what Taiwan is doing and what Brazil is doing, thinking how it can economically leap forward. Uh, that is just uh, a wonderful sign to me of, uh, of Israel being able to think like a country and not a, not a conflict. But I was, as I say, walking on the Tayelet and there was a young woman who passed by me and um, uh, I noticed she had a tattoo uh, just a, on, the, on her lower back. And I thought Herzl would be proud of that too. <laughs> I thought, Jews with tattoos. Jews with tattoos, that floats my boat, okay? <laughs> that is truly a sign of Israel becoming normal. Um, what I'm going to do this evening is, um, uh, I know some of you have read The World is Flat. Um, those of you who haven't, I know who you are. Okay. <laughs> I know where you live, what conference you go to. So um, uh, I'm actually have written the 3.0 edition of The World is Flat now, so I've been always updating the thesis. So I'd like to give you as a baseline, I'm going to take the next 35 minutes or so, to give you a baseline of what I actually mean by the world being flat, and then talk specifically about what it means for innovation and education. Now, um, I always begin by telling people, or really confessing to people, that um, I wish I could tell you I worked on this book for years and years. It eventually sprung fully loaded from my mind. The real truth is The World is Flat came about completely by accident. Um, I became the New York Times foreign affairs columnist in January 1995. And between January 1995 and September 11th, 2001, my column really shifted between what I call Lexus issues and olive tree issues. Issues of globalization, finance, trade, and technology, and issues of traditional ethnic conflict, um, uh, etc. cetera. I, I went from the Becca Valley to Silicon Valley and back. And I was really in that mode right up until September 11th when in light of what happened that day, I really dropped the Lexus, the globalization side of my column and focused entirely actually on trying to understand the roots of 9-11. I was in that mode right up until January of 2004. I had started doing documentaries for the Discovery Channel. We did one documentary on uh, the roots of 9-11, one on actually uh, the wall in the West Bank. And in January of 2004, we were sitting around with our Discovery team trying to figure out what should we do our next documentary on. And at the time, keep the lights like that, that'd be okay. Um, at the time, the big issue on the, uh, up, down, okay. Um, uh, at the time, the big issue on the world stage, I thought we should explore in a documentary, was uh, why does everybody hate America? Why does everybody hate America? And I scratched my head, how should we go about it? And I had this crazy idea, and this is how the whole book started. I had this crazy idea that what we should do is go to call centers, all over the world and interview young people, foreigners, who spend their days imitating Americans on what they think of America. That's how it all started. And we were literally budgeting out which call centers to go to, Philippines, Costa Rica, Bangalore, when John Kerry, then running against George Bush, came out with his blast against what he called Benedict Arnold CEOs, traitorous CEOs who engage in outsourcing. 
And suddenly this issue of outsourcing just exploded onto the world stage. So I said, time out. Why don't we just go to Bangalore, India and do the documentary on the other side of outsourcing. Let's look at this phenomena from the ground up. That's what we decided to do. We went off to Bangalore, February 15th, 2004. We shot about 60 hours of interviews in 10 days. And across those 60 hours of interviews, I got progressively sicker and sicker. And it was, it was not the Indian food. It was somewhere between the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to write my new software from Bangalore and the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to read my x-rays from Bangalore and the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to trace my lost luggage on Delta Airlines from Bangalore that I started to get this really sick feeling that while I had been sleeping, while I'd been off covering the 9-11 wars, something really fundamental had happened in the globalization story, and I had completely missed it. And it all came together with the last interview, which was with Nanda Nilakani, the CEO of Infosys, the Microsoft of India, an old friend of mine. We were sitting on the couch outside his office. The Discovery crew was setting up their camera inside. And at one, I had my laptop on my lap, and at one point Nanda said, Tom, I've got to tell you, the global economic playing field is being leveled. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down in my little laptop. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Well, after the interview, I got back in my Jeep, went back to my hotel. It was about an hour ride, and all the way, I kept rolling over in my mind what Nandana said. The global economic playing field is being leveled. And eventually it occurred to me that what he was really saying was that the global economic playing field was being flattened. And then in the crazy chemical way these things just happen, it popped into my head that what Nandan Nilakani, India's premier engineer entrepreneur, was telling me was that the world is flat. And I wrote that down in my notebook. The world is flat. I got back to my hotel, I ran up to my room, I called my wife back in Washington, I said, honey, I am going to write a book called The World is Flat. She now says she thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> it's not exactly how I remember the conversation. But in any event, I did call my editors at the New York Times and tell them, ladies and gentlemen, I need to go on leave, sabbatical, immediately. I need to go on sabbatical immediately because my software, the intellectual framework and lens through which I look at the world, is out of date. And if I don't go on leave immediately, I am going to write something really stupid in the New York Times. <laughs> it's a great way to get a leave, okay. So they... I began this book in March of 2004. I turned it in in December. Do not try this trick at home, kids. I blew out my forearms along the way, but in a fit of passion, answered that question for myself. What does it mean that the world got flat? Now, the meta argument of this book is that there have been three great era of globalization. The first era I call Globalization 1.0. It shrunk the world from a size large to a size medium. That year of globalization lasted from 1492 until the early 1800s. And that year of globalization was spearheaded by countries. That is, you went global through your country. The nation state was the agent of globalization. It was Spain exploring the Americas, Britain colonizing India, Portugal, East Asia, the agent of globalization was the country. Globalization 2.0 lasted from the early 1800s until the year 2000. That's right, it just ended. It shrunk the world from size medium to size small. And that era of globalization was spearheaded by companies. Companies searching for markets, resources, and for labor. Well, while you were sleeping, individuals 